Hi, welcome back. I'm Adam Rosen. So in today's episode, I want to go over um, some of the very common risks and complications of knee replacement. So some of you may be thinking about having a knee replacement. Um, some of you may be actually already scheduled for a knee replacement. I have a long discussion in the office with my patients. We have a lot of written handouts to uh, reinforce this information. And for each individual patient, I may go into more detail or depth depending on their health history because they may be more prone or more apt to have some of these complications. Uh, but I just want you to be aware of you know, what some of the potential complications are and make sure that you have a good thorough discussion with your surgeon. So first and foremost, if you're having a knee replacement, the biggest, most concerning complication that we worry about is infection. Um, and I'm gonna have a whole other talk on infection um, that I think people should watch and I hope that you never have to go through it because luckily infection rates are low, around 2% or less in the US. But if you have an infection, it's a big deal. You know, It usually requires additional surgery or surgeries and long-term antibiotics and the overall outcome of your knee can be very compromised. So we do worry about infection. Um, we do optimize patients. You know, So this is where if someone's overweight, we have you lose weight. If they have diabetes, it has to be controlled. If you're a smoker, it has to quit. But there are certain diseases that you can't change. So you want to make sure that the patient is as optimized as possible. We do a nasal swab. Some studies have shown that people that are higher carriers of staph, and this is tested by checking that in your nose, may have a higher risk of infection. And by decolonizing those patients by using antibiotic ointments prior to surgery, that may decrease their chance of infection. Um, we also have most patients do a wash. So you'll do a wash with chlorhexidine um, at home and the day of surgery prior to coming into the operating room. And we give everybody antibiotics. So you'll get your course of antibiotics around the time of surgery. But again, it's really important to optimize you know, yourself as much as possible to minimize anything that could increase the chance of an infection. The other thing that we worry about are blood clots, what we call venothromboembolic disease. Uh, so this would be any blood clot that occur in your leg or in your lung. Those are called pulmonary emboli or pulmonary embolus. You might hear it referred to as a PE. And I tell people, nobody is at low risk. You're having a surgery on your knee. It's a big deal. Um, so most people are at what we call normal risk, meaning there is a risk that you could have a blood clot in your leg or your lung. And there's a lot of things that we do to decrease that. So getting people up, moving, walking earlier, sooner decreases that risk. In the hospital, many times you'll have certain uh, foot pumps or calf pumps, the little squeezers, and doctors will put you on some form of a blood thinner. Most commonly now in the US and the world, more commonly people are using aspirin, um, which has a number of other additional health benefits. But if you are at a higher risk, um, so we consider normal risk or higher risk, and who would that be? Well, mainly in our world, anybody that's had a history of a blood clot for any reason at any point, you are at a higher risk of developing a blood clot. But there are certain people that may have other medical conditions that may also put them at a higher risk of a blood clot. So you may go on a more potent medicine that will help thin your blood even further. The downside of any blood thinner is that it also increases the risk of bleeding. So you always have to weigh and balance those appropriately. Because the next big thing we talk about is bleeding and bleeding risk. Obviously, any surgery can cause bleeding, but we worry more about bleeding that can cause a problem. So if your blood count drops significantly, and you need a blood transfusion, that is a big deal. There's a lot of risks that can come with that. So we try to do everything we can to minimize that. How do we do that? Most people do use a drug around the time of surgery that you'll get in the operating room typically. And this has been amazing. It has been breakthrough. It's called transexamic acid. And what that has done, at least in our setting, lowered our transfusion rate from what was previously about 20% to less than 1%. So it is extremely rare nowadays to need a blood transfusion. You know, in the 80s, even in the 90s, it was pretty common to donate your own blood before surgery. That's not done anymore because the risk of transfusion is so low. But we wanna optimize people. So if you do have a low blood count, what's called anemia, a lot of times you'll have blood tests checking for vitamin B12 or iron. If they're low, sometimes it's as simple as repleting those and that brings your blood count up. There are some other medicines um, that can be utilized to help stimulate your body to produce more blood cells prior to surgery. But again, that's something that would have to be talked to your doctor about. Um, the other things we worry about, wound complications. And again, this comes back to optimization. So if you have poor blood flow, you know, maybe you have poor artery blood flow, you've had stents or on a medicine. If you have poor blood flow, that can increase the chance of a wound complication. 
You know, if you're diabetic, that can increase the chance of a wound complication. If you're malnourished, if you're a smoker. So this is why all of those things have to be looked at, checked, and then optimized prior to going through surgery. So you lower the chance of that happening. Now, other risk factors, and again, these are even more rare, would be a fracture. So when we're putting these implants in the bone, we're manipulating the bone, we're cutting the bone, we're hitting things, you know, fracture can occur. Um, if that occurs, it more commonly can happen in osteoporotic people, people that have weaker bone to begin with, but it can happen in anybody. So it's something that your doctor will talk to you about and be aware of. And there's a number of ways that these can be treated if a fracture occurred at the time of surgery, but it depends on where the fracture occurred um, and what bone was injured and how much of the bone was involved. Ligament injury. So we're, again, dealing with sharp instruments. We're putting instruments in and out of your knee, and there's certain things called retractors that we use to protect the ligaments, but sometimes ligaments can be injured or damaged. And if that happens, occasionally they can be repaired or bracing is needed. Um, so again, one of the risks that we do worry about, but the risk is low. Other issues would be what's called a neurovascular injury, meaning an injury to a nerve or an injury to a blood vessel, like an artery or vein. Um, these can happen. These are rare. The major structures are behind the knee, so surgeons are aware of them, um, but it can happen, and they can be fairly devastating, unfortunately. So luckily, they're extremely rare, but if they do happen to that one person, even if it's the unique sort of one person, they usually have big, big problems. Um, so it's something that you should just be aware of ahead of time. Now, pain is a normal expectation after any surgery. I don't think anybody should go into surgery expecting it to be pain-free, um, but the pain for most people will come and go. There are some people that develop a horrible pain response. This can occur after minor injury and trauma or major surgery. It used to be called RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. It's more frequently referred to now as CRIPS or chronic regional pain syndrome. It can be very devastating. It's very difficult to treat, um, so it's something that we do watch out for, but again, extremely, extremely rare, but if you've had it before, maybe you've had an ankle fracture and developed it after that, you may be more prone to developing it after any surgery. Leg length discrepancy. So this is something that people are aware of. It is much more uh, frequent of an issue, even though it's still rare, in hip replacement surgery. In the knee, we have very fixed ligaments. Um, so it's very hard, you know, we try all the plastics which come in one millimeter increments and it's really hard if, to try to fit too big of a one and you almost can't get it in there. Um, so having a leg length discrepancy is very rare in knee replacements, but a lot of people can have a subjective leg length discrepancy, meaning if you were very bow-legged or very knock-kneed for a number of years and then the knee is straightened, straight as the crow flies, that leg will feel longer to you for a while, even though the bone lengths haven't changed. So it is something to be aware of, especially if you have one of these more severe deformities. And then also specifically, going back to nerve injury, um, if you have a, a specific deformity called valgus, or what you might know as knock need, people that are very knock need, there's a nerve on the outside of the knee called the perineal nerve. And when the knee is straightened, that nerve can be stretched. And some people will have weakness in their foot bringing it up, what's called a foot drop. Most commonly is temporary, but it is most frequently seen in people that have those severe knock need deformities and then have a knee replacement and the leg is straightened. The other thing we talk about is stiffness. Um, and I, again, you've heard me talk over and over again about range of motion, which is so important. There's a very small number of people that just don't get a little stiff. They get really stiff, and we call that arthrofibrosis. We're not exactly sure why. You know, is it a genetic predisposition? Um, is there some biological response? We're not sure, but some people do develop this, and it can be very debilitating. And even with additional surgery, it may not be easy to fix or ever be able to be made normal. Um, but luckily it's something that's very rare, so it's something that you wanna watch out for if your stiffness is way worse than what you or your therapist or doctor um, would expect in that early period. Now with any surgery, you're coming into a hospital, you're having anesthesia. So there's a number of medical issues, again, very rare, but based on you, your age and medical condition, conditions. The anesthesiologist will talk to you about risks of the anesthesia. You can have things like stroke or a heart attack, pneumonia, injury to your kidney, injury to your liver, even death. They're all extremely rare, but they're things that you should be aware of. Now, the other things, um, which again, I talk to my patients in this discussion of risks and complications, but you've heard me talk about it previously of normal expectations. So you will have some numbness. When we make the incision, usually on the outside, you'll have a little patch of skin, which is numb. That is normal. It is not technically a complication, and it usually goes away over a period of time, but some people are always left with a small area that may still be numb on the skin. The knee will feel warm. Again, it doesn't mean that you're infected, 
but it can be warm sometimes for up to two years. The knee will click, that's very common, and you can have a round appearance. It's not swollen with fluid, but the tissue in your knee can be a little thicker, it gives you that round appearance. Uh, and also kneeling, there are a number of people that sometimes have difficulty kneeling on the incision. So that's sort of just a, um, a general overview and summary of the major risks, complications, and expectations that you should expect after knee replacement. Um, obviously, again, this is just a generalized format. You have to speak to your surgeon and your doctor and go over the specific risks because based on your age or health conditions, you may have some of these or more of these or others um, that are very specific to your, um, your own health, your own age, your own risks um, and stratification that you're gonna go through prior to surgery. So I hope that you've found this enjoyable and helpful. Um, good luck in you um, taking care of your knee. And if you're looking forward to knee replacement, uh, good luck and look at my other videos for additional assistance in the physical therapy, which is oh so important to obtain a good outcome. You've been listening to Adam Rosen. Until next time, stay safe.